Emmy. If you're new to the channel, welcome. My name is Emmy. I'm a nutritionist and the creator of the Slim on Starch program where my clients lose anywhere from the last few pounds to up to 70 pounds and counting. So if you are looking to lose those last few pounds, eat a lot of potatoes and have food freedom, then go ahead to healthyemmy.org or just click the link in the down bar so that you can apply to work with me and my team. Also make sure that you hit subscribe and turn on the notification bell so that you can be notified every time the freshest news on plant-based weight loss it's coming at you live honeys so today I am doing a Q&A and let me say Q&A's are like my home I just feel like I am home I have a way with words don't I I honestly just love Q&A's like that I feel like this could be a Q&A channel and I would just be the happiest gal in the world I know that some people were asking for an injury update I'm thinking of doing a whole video about the injury that I had um, sciatica still have managing it but I was thinking about doing a video about it about what I learned from it how I coped with it you know taking off time from running what I'm doing now if you want that but you know what? Let's get into the Q&A. Alrighty, so I went onto Instagram and said, ask me some questions, honey. So if you're not following me on Instagram, follow me on Instagram. Okay, first question. How am I getting fatter following this diet? Honey, I feel you. A lot of people think I've been thin my whole life. No. <laughs> when I first went vegan, I actually gained weight because I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought that I was doing everything right. I was watching all the what I eat in the days and I was doing all the research and I was gaining weight. And I was like, what gives? You know, everybody else seems to be thriving on this diet, but I can't figure it out. So trust me, I get it. I've been there. And the food, it's not just the food. It's not just what you put on your plate. It's how you build your plate and also how you read your hunger and your fullness cues. In my program, we really teach you your hunger and your fullness cues and we have a hunger and fullness scale that we help guide you through because after so many years of dieting and eating processed foods and trying to escape your hunger, you simply don't know what it feels like to be hungry and full. And a lot of people believe that you should either be hungry or you should be full. When you're hungry, you get the green light and when you're full, you get the red light. It's not like that. We actually don't want to be hungry or full. We want to spend most of our lives between those two in that gray area, moving along that scale. And that's something that we talk about in the program. But that just goes to show that it is not just the food that you put on the plate. I wish it were that simple, honey. If it were that simple, then I wouldn't even have this YouTube channel because it would just be Oh, all you have to do is change the food and you're good. You're fine. Just change the food and you're good to go. No, because I did that and it didn't work. <laughs> so that's why I do what I do now because it is not just the food. It's how you make your plate, how you eat the food in, re in regards to listening to your body, listening to your hunger and your fullness cues, and then your long-term plan as well. Because you can do anything for 30 days, but what you can do for the rest of your life is the only thing that you should be doing. If you can't do a diet for the rest of your life, do, stop doing it today, honey, because what matters here is sustainability. So this is another thing that we do in my program is not only do we work together for these eight weeks, but also let's point out what you're going to do when the anniversary comes along, when it's your kid's birthday, on Christmas, on Thanksgiving, on Easter, all of these scenarios, we should have an idea what we're going to do for them. You know, are we going to eat this diet? Or are we going to eat something else? And being able to look long term is another piece of the puzzle that is going to make you successful. I just want to add on and say, you know, you can gain weight eating just starches, vegetables, fruits, and legumes. It's not, it's not magic in the sense that you can stuff yourself silly every day. If you stuff yourself silly on these foods, that is going to cause weight gain because eating outside of the realms of true hunger is what causes weight gain. There's no magic here. And I find that a lot of people, if they're struggling with binge eating, they'll just start binging on something else. They'll start binging on vegetables. And people say, you can't binge on vegetables. I see it all the time. I talk to people all the time that are binge eating on vegetables. And it's not just a matter of changing the food. That is a huge piece of the puzzle, but you can't finish out that puzzle unless you tune back into your hunger and your fullness cues. So the first thing is to do the first thing to do is to change the food. And then after that, let's work on your hunger and your fullness cues so that you can have the entire puzzle complete. 
Why don't you like fasting? Have you researched it? I don't dislike fasting. I think that there is a proper time and a place for fasting, and it's for individuals that are very, very ill. I know that, you know, at the True North Health Center, they take individuals who are on death's door, and they help fast them for their chronic diseases. Would I do fasting? Absolutely not, because I don't have a chronic illness that has no other solution to it. Fasting is wonderful if you have a very intense illness because what happens when you fast is your cells don't work on growth. Now, cancer is when your cells are growing too, too quickly. Your cells aren't focusing on growth anymore. Now they're focusing on repair and cleaning up the cell. And that's what you need to do if you have something like cancer. So that's what fasting does. Should I be doing something like that? No, because what my body is gonna do is it's gonna send me into a bout of overeating afterwards because it's a healthy body that is being deprived of food and then once food comes back into the environment my body's gonna want to make up for it and it's gonna be an ish show if you will I do not recommend fasting I mean intermittent fasting is fine that's like I do intermittent fasting every day but long-term fast more than a day I don't recommend um, they set people up for a binge they are a short-term solution it's just it's a very it's it's the path to disordered eating, and I don't want anybody to go down that path. The reason why a fast works in terms of weight loss is because you're starving yourself. Of course starvation is going to work, but just because something works doesn't mean we should do it. Just because you can rob a bank to get money doesn't mean that you should go rob a bank. Instead, you should make your money the good old-fashioned way, just like losing weight should be in the sustainable fashion, not by starving yourself. I, I have clients in my program who, I mean, hi Dan. Dan, he came to the program and he had just done a fast the year before and he was like, on that fast I got down to this weight, but it was because I wasn't eating and I can never do that again. And I was like, mm -mm, we're not doing that. We want you to eat yourself skinny. A fast sets you up for weight gain and it sets you up for a binge. And it sets you up to gain more weight than you originally did because what happens is when your body and your brain knows that there isn't I have a foot cramp when your body and your brain knows that there isn't food in the environment what happens is your brain your primal brain your lizard brain if you will remember our brains have not changed much much in the past 100,000 years will say oh my goodness there's a famine there's a famine, there's no food in the environment. So when food comes back into the environment, your brain did not forget about that famine. And your brain will say, oh my God, the food is back. There's probably gonna be another famine because history repeats itself. So I better eat up on all of this food. And your body will, will go into a state of overeating because it's been in fight or flight and right now it wants to protect you. So it's gonna cause you to overeat because of the past. Um, with there being a famine, your, your brain will be aware of that past famine, think that there's one coming in the future and cause you to overeat. So fasts are a recipe for di disaster unless you are very, very ill and you are being medically supervised under a fast. How long have you been vegan? What is your biggest, how long have you been vegan? What is your biggest piece of advice for new vegans? So I've been a whole foods plant-based vegan for six years now and my biggest advice to those that are wanting to go vegan is decide if you are going vegan or you're going plant-based for health reasons. Of course you can do both and I did both but when it comes to the food, the actual food, make sure that you know your why because you can be vegan and eat a standard American diet in, in the vegan sense and it's totally unhealthy but if you're an ethical vegan then that's like you do you but if you are doing this for health reasons, for weight loss, for healing chronic illness, whatever it is, then I recommend you call yourself whole foods plant-based and watch some documentaries like What the Health. I think that What the Health is just such an incredible documentary. So I would watch that one for health. If you are going vegan for environmental or um, ethical reasons, then you can watch Cowspiracy and Earthlings and then Forks Over Knives really encapsulates all of them. But definitely watch some documentaries. I recommend that everybody watch What the Health and Forks Over Knives is a really good one too. Will eating white potatoes that have a high glycemic index hinder fat loss on your diet? 
White potatoes are like my number one weight loss food because they are the most satiating food on the planet. Uh, there was a study done that took a whole slew of foods and the boiled white potato was off the charts, the one that was the most satisfying. Now when it comes to glycemic index, what glycemic index does not take into consideration is the amount of fiber something has, and the amount of fiber something has affects the glycemic load, which is actually how our body reacts to the food. And because potatoes are so high in fiber, the glycemic load is much lower. And if we were to base our diet just on glycemic index, we would actually be eating things like donuts and ice cream because ice cream has a lower glycemic index than potatoes do. And it's crazy, it's like something like carrots have a very high glycemic index in comparison to a cheeseburger. It's just wild. The glycemic index is a very silly way to, to just decide how healthy a food is because ultra processed junk foods have lower glycemic index than whole fruits and vegetables. It is just insane. So don't look at glycemic index. Just keep it simple. You know, back in the day, way, way back in the day, how were people supposed to know the glycemic index of foods? How were people supposed to know how many calories something has? That is something that was decided in a lab, and it's a measurement of heat. Calories is just a measurement of heat. It's, like, it's how much energy it takes to burn off one degree Celsius of a food or something along those lines. It's something where you hear it and you're like, what? What does that have to do with anything? It was something that was created in a lab. And back in the day, there was no way for people to know how many calories something had, but those people weren't overweight. And that just goes to show that we need not know these numbers, and they are just numbers that were decided by scientists based off of experimentation. So what we should do is just look at the whole real food and eat the whole real food and trust our bodies to guide us to how much of that food we should be eating. What are you doing for Easter? It's probably going to be my significant other and I, just the two of us, because I would, normally it would be like he, he and my whole family, but with everything going on with the coronavirus, that's not appropriate, honestly, to have a social gathering and it doesn't feel right. And if I, if I, it just wouldn't, I would feel yucky doing it because I, that's not doing my part in this whole pandemic and doing my part is not having these social gatherings. So it'll probably just be him and I, we'll make some dinner and <laughs> happy Easter. Is it normal to feel puffy after getting out of the paleo lifestyle and starting the plant food life? <laughs> I love how they wrote plant food life. So when you are eating a diet that's very low in carbs, that could have been paleo, it could have been any sort of low carb keto diet, and then you come to this lifestyle, your body is going to retain more water. The reason for this is that carbohydrates are stored as glycogen in the body. And for each gram of glycogen that our body stores, our body has to hold on to three grams of water. So of course, you're gonna be holding on to a lot of glycogen that you weren't previously holding on to on the low carb diet because you were depleted of glycogen, which is very, very unhealthy for our bodies. You were also very dehydrated because of it. So now you're holding on to glycogen, which allows for muscle repair. It allows for a healthy functioning body, and you also are more hydrated now. Because of this, you're going to hold on to a little bit more water weight and it's going to feel puffy at first. You'll feel puffy, but it'll start to go down. Your body is now entering a state of hydration that it wasn't previously in. And for a little bit of time, it's going to hold on to that hydration to repair everything that needs repairing inside of your body, but it will go down. It is not fat. It is not fat. It is just water and glycogen and I so so badly wish that people knew this so that they would stick with the diet and allow their body to heal, repair, and rest. Rest and digest. You're coming from fight, fight or flight and now it's time to go into rest or digest. Thoughts on the alkaline vegan diet. Super popular but it's full of oil and forbids the potato. <laughs> if something forbids the potato, why does it even exist? Okay, here's the thing. So I actually looked this up last night when I was laying in bed looking at the questions. And what I love about the alkaline diet is that it has a ton of whole foods on it. But what I dislike is that it doesn't allow for certain whole foods because of their acidity or how alkaline they are. And that just makes, I like to keep things so simple and that just makes 
zero sense to me. Looking from an evolutionary standpoint, just like I talked about earlier, how when people back in the day, before there were laboratories and all of this, how would people have known how many calories were in something? How would people have known the glycemic index of something? How would people have known the alkalinity of something or like the blood type diet? How would people have known their blood type? There's no way that nature would complicate it this much. There is just simply no way. You look at squirrels and tigers and all of these animals that are out in nature that do not have the brain, the brain capacity that we have, nowhere near the brain capacity that we have as humans, and they are a heck of a lot healthier than us. So that just goes to show that eating is something primal. Eating does not take higher level thinking. And what does take higher level thinking is knowing the alkalinity of certain foods. It just doesn't match up. And I think that the alkaline diet is something that appeals to diet hoppers. It appeals to nutrient chasers. It appeals to those people that are on a new diet every seven seconds. And they get really excited about it and they post on their Instagram about it. And you're just like, oh my gosh, they're on a, like, what now? What's the diet now? I don't want to be that and I want to help people not be that by keeping it simple and not having it be that you have to think about food all the time. Could you imagine if you had to know the alkalinity of every food? How bizarre that would be? Like somebody would offer you, I'm going to look up a food that's like, okay, could you imagine you're in the produce section and you have to know off the top of your head, alkaline diet. Let me look up these foods. <laughs> you're telling me I have to know the pH of certain foods? Please. Okay, so you're right, you're walking around the grocery store and you are supposed to know that cranberries have a pH of four, but broccoli has a pH of 10. Um, and oh, brown rice, that has a six, but celery has a 10 and kiwi is a nine. But if you wanna have some oranges with your kiwi, you might wanna be careful because those are an eight. It's just <laughs> insanity. That is so complicated. I would rather just go to the grocery store, have my starches, any of them. Potatoes, yams, corn, oats, quinoa, rice, millet, farro, starches, done. Okay, vegetables, any one that you can name. Fruits, any one that you can name. Legumes, there's over 10,000 different types of legumes. That is so much easier and so much more simple. And we need not complicate it because eating is a primal thing. All right, my honeys, I feel like I, that was probably, probably a little bit long, but that's okay. If you want another Q and A, go ahead and let me know. I love doing them and I'll see you in my next video. Bye. Oh, okay, the safe kiss guys. Remember the safe kiss during this time of coronavirus. Woo! Woo!